Isabella's going to come and read us Psalm 15. Thanks, Izzy. Lord, who may, me, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour or and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even, even when it hurts, and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Thanks, Izzy. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege, as always, to be opening God's word with you all. Let me add my word of welcome. Um, and for any new visiting with us, my name's Ryan. I'm the pastor here. And uh, yeah, it's... It's wonderful to open God's word week by week. And of course, at the moment, we find ourselves in the book of Psalms, which I described early on in the series as Israel's hymnal and indeed the church's first songbook. This is a book full of songs that experience the heights of human emotion as well as the depths of human agony. And here in our psalm this morning, we have before us a psalm of David that asks one great question, a question that we'll be spending time answering as we work through David's song this morning. But given the content of this psalm, I thought it might be helpful to give you a quick reminder of the context into which this psalm may have been written. Now, we're not told at the beginning of this psalm any of the particular context that's in David's life at this time, but it is worthwhile considering what the kingdom of God or the people of God in Israel looked like during the time of David. Most scholars believe that David wrote the bulk of his psalms, including this one, during his kingship, so not his early life as a shepherd, uh, though that, of course, had impact on how he wrote, but as a king and as a ruler in Israel, as God's anointed one, David wrote much of these psalms. And in the time of David's life and in his kingdom reign, the temple of Israel had not yet been built. The temple would be built by his son, Solomon. And so for David, the holy places of Israel were two. Firstly, there was the tabernacle, the great tent that had been constructed under Moses' leadership that had been with the Israelites through their time in the wilderness as they traveled through the plains of Sinai. It was with Joshua as they began the conquering of the land that would become Israel. And eventually the tent that was known as the tabernacle started to move around a little less. And during the time of Saul's reign, that is the king that preceded David, with whom David had the greatest of love-hate relationships, the tabernacle was moved only a couple of times. Ultimately, it settled in the land of Gibeon. And it was settled and established on a mountain there that was referred to as the high place of Gibeon or the holy hill of Gibeon. And all through David's reign, the tabernacle remained on that holy hill. Not so the Ark of the Covenant. Many of you would know that the Ark of the Covenant, which housed, among other things, the tablets of law written by God himself and given to Moses, the Ark of the Covenant, which usually dwelt at the heart of the tabernacle, had been captured in war by the Philistines. And under David's rule as a military king, the Ark of the Covenant was recaptured and it was not restored to the tabernacle. Instead, David had it taken to Jerusalem, where he constructed a special tent for it on Mount Zion, the eventual location of the temple not far from the king's own house and palace. It was established on the high place of Jerusalem. You see, for David and for all of Israel, high places had always had an affinity and an association with God. 
It was in the construction of a high place, the Tower of Babel, that God punished the earth. It was God's direction that the high places of the Canaanites and all the lands around Israel, that they were to cleanse, all their high places were to be destroyed or brought low. As we read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, one of the regular refrains is whether or not the king destroyed the high places of foreigners. The good kings did this, the bad kings failed to remove the high places. And mountains, of course, in our scriptures are crucially important to God's people. It is on mountains that God engages with his people. Firstly, in Mount Sinai, where the law is given, we see Jesus' transfiguration take place on a mountain. Moses ascended Mount Nebo before he passed away at the edge of the promised land. High places are crucial in God's economy. And in David's context, as he writes this psalm, speaking of a holy tent and a holy hill, he is no doubt referring to both the tabernacle as a holy tent on a high place and the Ark of the Covenant, which sat in a new holy tent, also on a high place in Jerusalem. And as David ruled, watching over these holy hills as part of his kingship, he would have seen much activity in Israel. Priests coming and going from within the sacred sanctuaries. Israelites coming day by day and year by year to offer their sacrifices and fulfill their religious ceremonies. And no doubt he would observe that many of these people, though true to their religion, were false in their lives. Their lives not matching the holy standards required by a holy God. Unworthy people coming to God's holy sanctuaries atop his holy hills. And I suspect that it is in, in observing this contrast that David asks the question at the beginning of Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Now, here we see, as we do with Jewish poetry, that idea of parallelism, the repetition of the same idea with different words to amplify its meaning. Who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may ascend your holy hill? These are the same ideas with different words designed to make the point even firmer. It adds weight to the question that David is asking. So too does his use of the personal name of God. We've said it a number of times already, but where you read Lord in capitals in your Bibles, it is God's personal name, his covenant name shared with his people and unknown by other nations. Known to Israel, known to David, he asks Yahweh, who may dwell with you? Who may enter the presence of God? Who may abide or endure with the Holy One? What David is asking at the beginning of this psalm is, what man is worthy of the privilege of being with God? And he asks this in a way that does not simply speak of Israelites coming and going, offering their sacrifices and moving on, nor priests entering and exiting God's holy places. David's question carries the idea of taking up residency with God. Some of your Bibles will use the word abide with you. Some may have the word dwell. It is the idea of being found continually in the company of the holy God on his holy hill, in his holy tent. This is a most important question that David asked. Dwelling is more than simply passing through. It is a restoration of human's design. Looking back at the creation of man and woman in the story of Adam and Eve, we see that they dwelt with God, that God was with them and moved among them. And David's language here at the beginning of the psalm Ask the question, who is worthy of that privilege now? 
Who can abide with the holy God? What follows in his psalm is the answer to the question that he poses. Now, I will say that this is not an exhaustive list. David is, after all, being poetic in the way he writes, and he is writing a song rather than a theology. But what he offers in this psalm to those who sing it and those who consider it is a checklist of sorts, a grading system, we might say, of how people need to measure up if they are to dwell with God. And so what we're going to do this morning is work through that checklist and see how we measure up against it. And then we'll consider the grace that God has shown in the way he has acted towards us. Let's look at verse 2 as David continues, answering this great question of who may dwell in God's holy tent, who may live on his holy hill. He begins the answer with these words. The one whose way of life is blameless. The one who does what is righteous. The one who speaks the truth from their heart. It's a pretty high bar to set at the beginning of the answer, isn't it? The one whose life is blameless. The one who is without fault, without sin. The idea of being blameless means that God has nothing to count against you. This speaks of one who has not in any way transgressed the law of God. No one who has committed any transgression of God's own law. One who has lived perfectly according to God's own standard. David presses on even further. One who does what is righteous. If blamelessness is the absence of things being counted against you, Righteousness speaks of the things counting for you. Righteousness speaks of the one who acts rightly according to God's standard. Their actions, their choices, their thoughts, it all is pleasing to God. The one who is right will in any circumstance do what is approved by God. Taken together, the blameless overrules the negative that we might see And righteousness approves of the positive we might see. Together, these lines speak of one who avoids all wrongdoing and in their actions does all, to coin a word, right doing. This one who is both blameless and righteous, David says, will also speak the truth from their heart. Some older translations or alternate alternate translations will use the word in their heart. Probably a more accurate translation, the one who is holy and worthy of God's presence should be speaking truth in their heart. It speaks to a consistent purity within this holy individual, one who is both outside and inside aligned with God. We see later in Scripture that what comes out of a person is a reflection of what is inside their heart. And here David understands that. And he says that the one who is worthy of God's presence will be both inside and outside concerned entirely with God's truth. They will have God's truth in their heart and from that heart outwardly will flow a life of truth, a blameless, righteous life. David's first answer to his own question is that it is the blameless, righteous, truth-grounded person. That is the one who may dwell with the Lord. How are you going on the checklist so far? It's a pretty high bar, isn't it, that David sets? I imagine an Israelite singing this song perhaps unthinkingly, thinking that they are ticking these boxes when, in fact, David pens this song knowing that no one can. And yet David continues in this song. Speaking of the one who may ascend to the place of God and dwell with him, he sings in verse 3, the one whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbour, 
who casts no slur on others. Continuing with the theme of words, that which comes from the mouth and is guided by the heart, David says the Holy One will have no slander. That is, they will not speak falsehoods about another. Slander, usually taking place behind someone's back, is a degrading statement about the other person. This is manifested most commonly in gossip and is a poisonous trait in the life of the believer. David understands that a holy person will not be given over to slander, nor will they be one who slurs others. The slur language of the final line of this verse speaks to the derogatory statements that someone might make about another, either behind their back or to their face. But the key idea in this verse is found in its central line. David, speaking of the blameless, righteous one worthy of dwelling with God, says that they will do no wrong to their neighbour. This single line summarises the final six of the Ten Commandments that were laid down to Israel and endure to us today. The final six of the Ten Commandments speak about how people are to treat one another, how we are to conduct ourselves with other image bearers of God. Jesus later summarises those six great teachings as love your neighbour, the positive wording of David's negative sentence. The person who can abide with God is one who fulfills his law as it pertains to other people, perfectly loving thy neighbour. I'm going to ask again as we make our way, does anyone else feel like they're not getting a passing grade on this exam? David's not done yet, and neither are we. He presses on, verse 4, who may dwell in the sacred tent, the one who despises a vile person, but honours those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts, and does not change their mind. The beginning of this verse speaks to the consistency one has with their approach to God. The second half speaks to the consistency one has within their life. They are consistent in how they see people through the lens of godliness and consistent with their own promises. We're told here at the beginning of verse 4 that the Holy One will despise a vile person. They will detest, if you like, those who do evil. Now, we tend to think that in loving our neighbours and loving others, we cannot despise them and we should not despise them. But David is speaking about maintaining the honour of God, not affirming that which is evil. He tells us that we as the holy people are to reject and despise that that stands counter to this. That same idea does carry through to our New Testament. Though we are called to love others, we are not called to affirm them. In Romans 1, reading from verse 29, Paul is laying out to the church the kind of wickedness that we can expect when people stray from God. And having gone through a great number of things, Paul continues in verse 29 of Romans 1 saying this, He says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, They not only continue to do these very things, and he concludes, but also approve of those who practice them. The person who approves of ungodliness is bundled in with those who do what is ungodly in Paul's great list of Romans 1. And so it is that with David, Paul would say that as holy ones of God, though we are in the world, we are not to be of the world. 
And though we are called to love others, we are not called to affirm sinfulness. Rather, we are called to despise that which is counter to God's holiness, both within ourselves when we stray into sin, but also within others when we see image bearers of God living counter to his desires. David says that the Holy One, the one worthy of dwelling with God, will despise sinfulness as it is manifested in others. And he goes on to say, but they will honour those who fear the Lord. This is the counterpoint to that first line of the verse. The Holy One will reject vileness, evilness, but will embrace that which is of God. Those who fear the Lord are the wise and godly people. They are his people. And so the Holy One will honour them and approve of what they do as they seek to follow God. Taking, taken together, these two lines depict one who rightly honours God regardless of who they are engaging with. If they are acting and engaging with another person who honours God, they will together celebrate that and affirm one another. If they are enacting with one who is unholy, who is still given over to sin and who does evil and what is vile, though they may engage with them, they will not give approval. They will despise those actions and detest that sin. And David goes on speaking of this consistency. He says, those who may ascend the mountain of God are those who keep an oath even when it hurts and do not change their mind. Now, I will say that we are told by Christ in his Sermon on the Mount that we are no longer to swear oaths, but to simply let our yes be our yes and our no be our no. But Christ encourages us in that verse to remain faithful to our commitments that when we say no, we mean no. When we say yes, we mean yes. And here, David understands that same thing. That when one swears an oath or makes a promise, they will be faithful to it. In the context of what David is saying, it makes sense to assume that these oaths are commitments toward godliness. That the person who makes the oath to fear the Lord and follow the Lord will not be wavering from that despite what may come. That though they may be surrounded by what is vile and what is evil and what is sinful and unholy, they will press on for God having sworn to do so. They will not waver from that commitment regardless of what comes, be it grief or pain or torment or torture they will press on with what they have sworn to do. If you're not feeling the weight of David's words by now, let me encourage you, you may need to work on your self-awareness. This is a pretty impossible list that David writes and that Israel used to sing together. The bar is incredibly high, in fact, impossible to attain. And David concludes with these words finally. Verse 5 of Psalm 15. The one who lends money to the poor without interest and who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Within the many laws that Israel had handed down to them by Moses and the other men of God, there were mandates that they were to care for one another with the lending of money that this was to be done without interest and without expectation of repayment. But I do not think that it is simply a restating of these laws that David has in mind when he writes these words. Rather, he speaks to one of the cruelest idols that humanity faces. David speaks to the love of money. Christ himself describes the love of money as the root of all kinds of evil. And here, David helps us see that the one who is holy, the one who is worthy of God's presence, is one who is not given over to love of money. They will freely lend it to those in need, and they will not be compelled by it in contexts that do not demand it. 
They will neither be hesitant in loaning, nor will they be willing to accept unearned money. The righteous one won't be corrupted by the love of money as all too many of us are. They won't mistreat others with it, and they won't mistreat others to get it. They will be solely focused on God and being godly in any and every situation. David concludes this psalm, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Those words are echoed in a number of psalms, the idea that the one in God will not be shaken. Psalm 112 is one such place. I'm going to read to you just a few verses from Psalm 112, where David again says, from verse 6 of Psalm 112, Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear, and in the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. The righteous endure forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honour. Psalm 112 paints much the same image that David crafts in Psalm 15, that the righteous one will not be a lover of money, that they will be a lover of what is good and godly, and that they will give to those in need, that they will stand against what is evil, and in doing so they will dwell with God unshaken, unmoved forever. The righteous one, says David, the one who is worthy of standing in the presence of God within his holy tent upon his holy hill, they will not be moved. They will not be shaken from their secure footing. They will stand forever with God. That is the list that David offers in answer to his own question. That is the song that was on the lips of Israel and on the lips of the early church. As we have treated it as something of a checklist, the question must be asked, how did we all do? In our own strength, I trust that the answer is that we failed miserably. That is the reality of the human condition. As sinners and those given over to temptation, we fail, I trust, at every level. And I imagine when David wrote this psalm and when Israel sung it, that was the intention, that the people of God would realise how far short they fall of the status God has given them, that no one deserves to dwell in the tent of the Lord, that no man deserves to ascend his high places and abide with him. Why would David write this psalm then? It does not lead us to hope. It does not lead us to a place of comfort. But instead, it leads us to a place of reality where we realize just how far short we fall of God's standard. And it is perhaps with this idea in mind that David writes some of his other psalms. If you're still with me, I want you to take your Bibles and turn just a few psalms over to Psalm 24. Psalm 24 is another psalm of David. And I think perhaps the answer to the question he posed. I'm going to read for us from Psalm 24, beginning at verse 1. David declares, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not swear, sorry, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. 
Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. In the Hebrew, there is thereafter the word selah, which is a word that encourages the singer or the reader to pause and reflect on what has been said already before they can sing, continue singing what lies ahead. Do you see that David asks in this psalm that very same question in verse 3? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And as he continues on, he points out that it is those who have received vindication and blessing from God, their saviour. Friends, David understood that no one is worthy of standing in the presence of God. That the only way it would be possible for a person like you or me to dwell in the high and holy places of God is if God himself moves to save them from their situation. And so he encourages in verse 6 of Psalm 24, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. David urges the Israelites around him, those who he knows to be sinful and fallen and blamed, not blameless, those who are sinful and not righteous, he urges them to seek the face of a God who can save them. Of course, David could not know the fullness of what he is encouraging living that side of Christ. But he continues in Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. David praises God, knowing that it is God alone who can win the battle we need won. God alone who can be the saviour of humanity. And so he encourages Israel and us to trust in the God who can save, to seek his face and come to him in the hope of blessing and vindication. Well, as our scriptures unfold and as history tells, we now know exactly how it is that God brings about that blessing, how it is that God brings about that vindication and how it is that God manifests himself as saviour of humanity. He does this all, of course, through Jesus. God's own Messiah, God's own son found in human likeness who comes and lives the perfect life, the one who is blameless and righteous, the one who does despise evil and does what's right, the one who enables us to live in the fear of the Lord, the one who cared not for the idols of this world, especially money, the one who satisfies the requirements laid down in Psalm 15, the one who would then die in our stead and rise again victorious enabling an unworthy people to receive his own holiness, his own status, and so dwell with God forever. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, reminds us that that has taken place. In 1 Corinthians 6, he lays out a great list of sinful behaviours. He says that none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. None of them will dwell with the Lord. He says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on to say, that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Paul reminds us that when the unrighteous, the transgressor, the one who is undeserving of God and his presence, when they come to Christ, when they receive God's own spirit, they are indeed blessed and vindicated, made like Christ and enabled to dwell with God forever. 
That is what Psalm 15 does. It helps us to reflect on our status as fallen, sinful human beings. It takes us to the pit of despair where we realise just how far short we have fallen so that we might look to God, now look to God in Christ and see how blessed we are to receive the status we have received. As children of God, it is far too easy to take what Christ has done for granted. Psalm 15 reminds us of just how far Christ has brought us. Out of the depths of despair, out of the shortcomings and the shortfalls of our own sinfulness, he has prepared us and equipped us and blessed us to stand in the presence of God. That is why he is worthy of all honour and praise. It's my prayer that as we look through Psalm 15, as you read it in the future, you will see just how far Christ has brought you, that you are one who may ascend the holy hill. You are now one who can dwell in the sacred place of God, and that in Christ you will ascend the highest heights and dwell forever in the presence of your Lord. Let's turn to him in prayer and praise now. Would you join with me in prayer? Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we read the words of Psalm 15, we are reminded just how far short we fall of your standard. That your expectation for holy living is blamelessness and righteousness. That you desire those who would perfectly fulfill every facet of your law. And we are reminded by these words just how far short we fall of your glory. And so it is with renewed thankfulness that we praise you for the gift of Jesus. The one who has brought about our vindication and our blessing and our salvation. That we, unworthy as we were, have been made into those who may dwell in your presence. And that we will have the privilege of doing that for all eternity. Help us to never take this lightly and never take it for granted, but to praise Christ all the more for what he has done in saving us. May all the glory and honour that comes from this salvation be given to you, for it is you alone who has worked this for our salvation and for your own praise. And so we ask that you might enable us in our lives to better reflect your holiness and to more often sing your praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.